introduce the class today, and our guest speaker is our youth pastor. He and his wife both have a background in science and the sciences, so I'm going to let him introduce that piece. But without further ado, let's have a word of prayer and begin. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that our conversation would reflect your glory in all that we say and do. I pray that you would help the information we're about to receive and share would be helpful in, in understanding uh, creation versus evolution, uh, dealing with school and other issues, and and uh, pray that you just help us, Lord, to ha have a, an increasing understanding and awareness of your creation and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Introduce and speak, sir. Oh, thank you, John. I appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for letting me speak here and have some of your time. So, um, this class gets really into a lot of depth and specifics on creation versus evolution. So, I'm really excited how deep we can go. What I want to do today is really just give a broad overview and really challenge the idea of what we call science and how we view truth. Because this is essentially everything that deals with truth and science. So, um, I come from a scientific background. I, I'm uh, just getting my master's in chemistry, so inorganic electrochemistry, which is among the hardest of the hardcore sciences. It's putting them together all of your chemistry knowledge. And so we get a very, really uh, fundamental understanding of how the world sees and views science. So Tani has a, a degree in biochemistry. That's way beyond me. So biochemistry deals with much bigger molecules, and um, I just can't memorize all of that stuff. So she's smarter than me with that. So I deal with the really, really small stuff. So I get to look at the very fundamental level of creation. And this is what comprises what goes on to consist of evolution. You know, it kind of starts at the chemical level, and I get to kind of question each piece of that. I really see all of the assumptions that go on in evolution. So, in my journey of, oh my goodness, see, 2018, eight years of college of science, chemistry science, um, what I found to be true in science was starting to shift quite substantially. So, how America sees science is the highest level of literature is publications. Highest level of literature, people gain truth. Um, I'd say the secular world gains their truth off of anything that's published. You always hear people say, scientists say that this and this happens. So people grasp on to what scientists say, right? Have you ever heard that before? They grasp on what scientists say is true. And that clock is backwards. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> So they grasp onto this truth, and what they hold on to is true. So what God was teaching me throughout my college experience is, is what should we hold on to is truth. And a long story short, because my limited time, um, he showed me that his word is my foundation. This, this word of God, and I have my Bible with me, it's in the other room. It's a mistake, huh? <laughs> But the Word of God is my foundation of truth. I call it foundationalism. I come from Rene Descartes, questioning how he proves his existence. And, you know, that's what evolution tries to do. Evolution tries to prove why we exist, where we come from. But the real question is, how do we know what is true? And so, long story short, found out that God's Word is consistent 100% of the time. Whether you believe it or not, it's a cause and effect that always happens regardless of your disposition, disposition of belief. And that, to me, is real science. right? I observe, I read a hypothesis, that's like the Bible. If I read it like the Book of Laws, or, uh, you know, there's laws, that means there's a lawgiver. God gave the laws of the universe. He says something happens a certain way, and it happens. Uh, my professor in my physics class, upper division physics, and we wrote up, Equations that filled three whiteboards full. And at the end of the class, we were like, <gasps> and he just stopped, he stood back, and he's like, these are the laws that govern the universe. And immediately, God hit my heart, so boom. And who makes laws other than a lawmaker? 
And mm. this is powerful to me, because mm -hmm. all of a sudden I was understanding truth, the truth of God's word being spoken out. Now, when we get to evolution, this started to change the way I viewed science. Um, I'm the person that writes these scientific articles now. I write these publications, and I see everything that goes into you, into them, and I can attest how many mistakes there are. <laughs> First thing we learn, <laughs> giving a presentation in front of the department, professors, and all the students, question asked, well, how do you know it works this way? And my friend Kevin said, well, because the, the literature says it does. It's published. <laughs> and at that moment, he understood <laughs> that just because something says it is right doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> so you start to question how we view science. And so when we get to the heart of science, what we call science, it's the um, scientific method. And that's make a hypothesis, and then based on your observations, you build uh, your theory. So evolution started with, as you sh I'm sure you know from this class, is Darwin he started this idea called evolution, which he only developed a hypothesis that I didn't fully believe in. Well, I don't know if you've gotten to that point already. Okay, sweet. So, how many of you has observed one species turn into another? Okay, I don't believe anyone on the earth actually has. We usually do something that scientists usually uh, don't like. It's called extrapolation. We want to avoid extrapolation because we haven't actually observed any of that data. So we extrapolate our period of existence, well, most people live for 80 years, 100, whatever, and we extend it to 500 million. <laughs> you see how this kind of can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where we get the interesting territory of science into not science. and. Um, from here, I just want to give you a couple of examples I found of why I don't uh, think evolution is a good theory. So personally, uh, a couple of things I found evolution is not a good theory is, uh, one, the link fossils are not observable. So you ever seen those, uh, the link fossils are these, you ever seen the ape that goes into a man? And there's like 10 steps that it mm -hmm. And then finally it ends up with this guy hunched over at a computer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the problem with that is those 10 different steps, they've never found one fossil record of that. So yeah, you got dinosaurs. We're talking about dinosaurs. And we're talking about the flood today. We just don't see any one species turn to a, another species. You don't see a land animal convert to a bird. You don't see in the middle of that process. And if evolution there was real, uh, that, it, that occurred, then you'd see different intermediate species. For example, you don't see, uh, let's talk about the biggest one is apes to humans. And they think that eventually evolved from an ape to a human. And this is going to lead me to the next part of DNA. It's a fun one. Uh, you guys talked about DNA? Yes. Okay, great. So we should see, theoretically, this theory is true, one person becoming a human from an ape. At a different time in the world, you'd see a different variation of this ape human, maybe with five arms or six arms. But we don't see it. We're all the same humans with exactly four limbs all bleed red with one heart, and um, I just don't see those links there. But what I do see is something I like to call adaptation. So when you look at the molecular level, uh, specifically bacteria, uh, Tony more, knows more about this than I do. Um, what would they call evolution? I more call adaptation. So bacteria can develop something called like resistances. So antibiotic resistances is more of an adaptation. You know, you take somebody who lives in Africa, adapted to a really hot environment. The human, they call it evolution, people are evolving, but I think we're just designed in a very unique and beautiful way where we can easily adapt to our environment. So you take that person in the hot environment, put them in 
uh, Antarctica, or where an Eskimo lives, it's not going to work very well until he goes and adapts to it. And I think that's what science scientists are trying to observe. They're, what they're observing mostly is uh, something called adaptation. And so that's a distinction I'd want to make. Um, then from here, uh, a couple of fun examples, uh, just because I don't have much time left, is a DNA. I was reading this article this morning on how you know, a lot of this develops just from our DNA and how close our DNA is related to dinosaurs and different bacteria and whatever. So we have this train of thought that doesn't really follow. People are like, apes are 90 percent DNA matched to humans. Therefore, we must be related to apes. Well, if I use that same logic, my secular microbiology professor once told me, um, the closest DNA match of everything else creation, we are most closely related to sea moss. So, fancy that. Read this article, <laughs> we're closer, also 60% uh, close to worms. And they said, this tells us our history and how we came to be. So we are really related to our wormy cousins. And I'm like, okay. And then the next one's 50% related to bananas. <laughs> well, and, kind of moss. Yeah. So we're all related somehow. Well, to me, I'm connecting all this data points. It looks like scribbles. And you can't get any sort of conclusion out of that. Other than that, God uses DNA in similar fashions. Mm -hmm. We have 99.9% .9 of DNA differences between us, but still huge differences, yet we're very much human. So I don't believe there's that uh, connection that really follows the line of evolution thought. So, uh, you know, with this, we really want to just call into question drawing these conclusions that don't really follow. So that's, the, I'd say, the biggest thing I want to share today. Um, I'm about 15 minutes in, so uh, okay. anything else? Any questions? I have one. Yes, please. How does your, how does your worldview mm. as, as, a, as a Christian influence how you write now that you're writing these oh, publications? Okay. Yeah, so if I'm writing a publication, you know, it depends what I'm writing. It doesn't change too much on how I write it, uh, but it doesn't really conflict with my Christianity. Like, for example, I, I work on Catalyst, so I wouldn't really need to write anything about God specifically in my Catalyst. No. However, right. um, in my thesis, well, in my dedication page, first thing I wrote is I dedicate this life and thesis and everything I have to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I give automatically God credit to where credit is due. I understand um, why my worldview changes it. I understand that God made science, and what I observe doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. I still call everything I see into question and hold God's word into the fullest level of truth. So talking about worldviews, I hold God's word always as truth. If what I observe in science doesn't line up with God's word, it must be how I'm concluding science versus God's word. Science needs to change, not God's word. Mm -hmm. So does that answer your, is that what you're? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was knowing you're writing for a, an audience of people who aren't necessarily going to believe how you come to your conclusions, even though it does hold up. I just wondered how that, but truth is yeah, truth. Do, yeah, do you have an example you're no. thinking about or? No, I, I was just thinking, because you started out saying that America sees truth through publication. All right. So how do I communicate that? Yeah. Um, I'll have conversations. That's a good question. I'll have conversations with people and start to call into question some of their facts. And then if, you know, God's opportunity, giving me the opportunity, I'll start to call into question kind of their foundation um, of their level of science. You know, a really nice and respectful way, but... Um, try to get to the question, how you know what you know is true? And I can lead that conversation to, I know God's word is true, 
because it happens 100% of the time. I can do a chemical reaction the same way, 100%, same conditions, but it won't always work. So my faith in that science is only like 50% shakable. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But God's word is unshakable, and that's usually how I am able to generate a conversation with somebody. It really depends on the circumstances, though. It's a unique um, position. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, it's really fun, mm -hmm. but it probably yeah. just comes from understanding what I can hold as true and unshakable. Yeah. And it gives me that unshakable rock that I stand yeah. on. And something you said when you began the answer to the question, though, is really important. Uh, the uh, burden of proof is not on God or the Bible, the burden of proof on its detractors, which would include science. If yeah. science wants to take issue, the burden of proof is on the scientific method and its results, the conclusions, the presuppositions, and so on. So yeah, that's, that's another piece, yeah. too. That's very, very true. true. Very true. Yeah. That's very true. I guess the last thought I could share is um, how the scientific community is kind of shifting. Uh, being in the university and you knowing the dean and the professors, uh, it's Shifting more towards um, creationism nowadays, I find there's a lot less, I mean, to be honest, I haven't been challenged much on my views of creationism in the university, even bringing it up in class. I've had, uh, it's known usually as the guy who talks about God or uh, <laughs> creationism, even my biology, but my professor, uh, Dr. Walker, phenomenal guy, we're learning about something called cytochrome C and how this, without cytochrome C, it's an electron carrier in your mitochondria, in your cell, that gives you uh, fuel, essentially ATP. Um, it goes on the outside of the membrane into the membrane. Now, how can somebody travel outside of your body? Or it's not necessarily your body, you're talking about a cell, but it's outside. Um, and my professor comes to me after class and he's like, you ready to go learn more about anti-evolutionary stuff on Friday? <laughs> like, yeah! <laughs> and in class, he brought up, it's like, now how can this evolve? Because <laughs> how can an outside piece get attached to it without being intelligently designed that way? And so that's kind of the thought um, that is out there in a uh, larger percentage nowadays on the university side. So, wow. Um, Are you finding a lot less anger? Um, against your view? You know, I, I've rarely run into angry people when talking about science and God and hate capacity. Um, there's definitely still some out there, but yeah, as long as you're very loving and respectful in how you talk about it, if you're just open for an honest conversation, 99% of the time have a very, very beneficial conversation. So yeah, yeah less, less anger. So you're yeah. finding that people are becoming more theists, like they think that there is something there, but he's just not, he's not. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, and Utah's a split. If people move away from Mormonism, it depends on the past. The first line for Mormonism is atheism. But if they don't have religion, it's usually, uh, it's a higher power, but I just don't know who God is, who that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any more questions? All right, well, thanks so much, Don. Well, for thank you, me. both of you, for minutes. coming, and uh, thank you for supporting him and letting you, him use you as a reference. Or a, or a reference. Yes. But, um, very smart. yeah, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, to sort of pick up on it and continue on, on some of the thought here, too. Uh, the burden of proof and the acceptance within the academic community and those sorts of things. Uh, a few years ago, I taught here for four years in computer. I was a computer teacher for four years, um, 2003 to 2007, I think it was. And uh, during that time, about 2005 or six, a team was invited, uh, a secretary in the science department knew of this team and uh, their area of specialization was um, uh, basically uh, creation science and intelligent design. And so they came here to the school since they were available in the area and they, they spent time sharing with the student body and so on and so forth and talking about some of these concepts. Then they went on over to Weber. 
there was an amazingly vitriolic uh, uh, reaction from vocal members of the science department at Weber. How dare you do this? And the secretary almost got fired for even making this available, which I thought was an interesting. So if it's receiving a more, uh, if it's getting a better reception, that's a good thing. That's progress. But there is a history, the burden of proof and the acceptance within the academic community and those sorts of things. Uh, a few years ago, I taught here for four years in computer. I was a computer teacher for four years. Um, 2003 to 2007, I think it was. And uh, during that time, about 2005 or 6, a team was invited, uh, a secretary in the science department knew of this team, and uh, their area of specialization was um, uh, basically uh, creation science and intelligent design, which is about their atheism. Religion doesn't necessarily include God. So anyway, I just I just thought I'd kind of throw that out. And it's good to hear that uh, there is better reception for that. Probably a lot of it is his ability to talk to people in non-threatening ways and still share truth. And sometimes, depending on how you do it, you know, I, I was out on the street with a guy and he invited us to go along and he was, everybody he saw, he was in a wheelchair, so I guess he had an axe to grind. He said, you know, Jesus is coming. You better turn or you're going to burn. Literally, he said that, turn or burn. <laughs> and uh, I said, now, do you, do you really think that's going to gain you any kind of an audience to share what you actually believe? Because, you know, that kind of thing, if you start out saying you're going to hell, but unless you turn, you're going to burn. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a pretty uh, stiff steep hill to climb to say, okay, let's have a conversation. I don't think so. <laughs> Get out of my face, you know. So, um, but uh, having said that, there may be an increasing receptivity uh, to these kinds of thinking. Because as I've said several times, and he, he just kind of mentioned it again, there are a lot more questions that science has to answer uh, and evolutionists have to answer and grapple with, for which they have no answers. They have guesswork. Mm -hmm. And this concept of extrapolation he mentioned is important as well. Because the only way to get from uh, primate to human, no matter how small you cut the steps, in the fossil record they are abrupt jumps. They aren't, it's not a smooth transition. They just sort of suddenly show up which supports the biblical uh, explanation of created each one after its own kind. So you can extrapolate, but as he said, and I think this is true, extrapolation leads to fiction. It leads to questionable conclusions. Um, extrapolating should head you toward the next thing you're going to prove or disprove in pursuing your hypothesis toward a theory <coughs> But extrapolation should never be the basis for truth, quote unquote. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are some important concepts. Uh, did you appreciate what he had to share? Yeah. See, I mean, you know, he's got he's gonna about to have a master's degree in this stuff. His wife is a microbiology micro biochemistry. Um, maybe it's what does she say? Electrobiochemistry. Anyway, a different form but very specialized. And this, this, this is important stuff because, as he said, this, his professor said, this thing comes from the outside in to contribute to the process. Well, how does, how does that evolve? <laughs> you know, there's an adaptation that takes place. There's a, I mean, uh, if you watch pictures of sharks and they have these little pilot fish going along with them and keeping the crap off of them, or whales, you know, they'll eat the, the algae and stuff off their skin. I mean, it's a it's a, a mutually agreeable relationship. So uh, anyway, there there's a lot of that there, and uh, I'm glad he was able to come and share. Did you take my outline? He did. Good. So now we'll dive in. Any any further questions? I guess we don't have an outline. Is there any notes? No. There are notes. <laughs> I left them at the front table. You know.
Okay. Thank you. Yeah, why don't you pass the stack back? The whole stack. The whole. Oh, they don't have one. Nobody has one. I put them up here. Just pick up the stack, hand it back. Everybody <laughs> take one. <laughs> Not a difficult pass process. Stack back. Does anyone need this? These one? are even flat. I know. <laughs> But then I got one. Okay. So let's get back to our topic at hand. Not back to it, but I mean, I sort of teased it last week. But what we're going to talk about now is were dinosaurs carnivorous prior to the fall and flood? In other words, did they eat meat? Now, we, we have visions of sharp, pointy teeth, and they obviously can't eat vegetable matter, right? We assume that. We extrapolate that. All right, fiat creationists generally agree that dinosaurs and all other animals were strictly herbivorous, that is, they ate plants. Uh, the, the Jurassic Park, the, the brother said he's a vegisaur, or something like that. <laughs> Vegisaurus. Prior to the fall of Genesis 3, the meaning of 1 29 to 20 in Genesis seems plain enough. Then God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. So that given statement also seems to point toward a fully formed, functional um, yeah. ecosphere yeah. into which these people and animals are introduced. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a ready-made instant food chain starting with plants. Mm -hmm. So eat your vegetables, people. Right. Especially kids. Yeah, okay. So when they became carnivorous is another issue. Genesis 9, 2, and 3 says, and the fear of you and the terror of you, talking to uh, uh, Noah and his, his kin, uh, shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So, uh, now the, it says the plain sense here. The plain sense of this passage is that human beings did not eat animal flesh until after the flood by extension. This could be construed to refer to animals, dinosaurs included as well. Um, now, uh, construal and extension are words that are similar to extrapolation, so I want to be careful here. Um, it doesn't specifically say animals, uh, dinosaurs ate plants, but it does say plants are food for everything that moves on the surface of the earth. Doesn't deal with creatures under the sea, yes? So what happened between when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden and then the flood? What, what's the... Hey, you mean, do you want a chronological, who do you mean what happened no, between? No, I'm, I, as far as, as far as... Um, what changed? Yeah. I think she made like the... As far as, far as yeah, as far as, are, are, we, are we assuming that everything was still plant-based? Your food source. Your food, the food yeah. source was plants. Um, Abel brought an animal offering, whereas Cain brought grain. Right. Uh, we don't know if it's the animal or the grain that was the difference or the attitude with which the offering was brought. Right. Uh, so if I'm understanding your question, what changed? When Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, they still had to uh, get their sustenance from the soil. And he said, you're going to be out there, and you're no longer just going to have it falling off the trees. You're going to have to work hard to survive and grow crops and do the things you need to eat stuff. But what you're saying is that, that the world at large was still vegetable areas. Vegetable. Sure. Vegetable Aryans. I like it. Linguistic. That's how Madeline said it. Okay. So, uh, yes. I, okay. I would say so. Okay. That's what I was. Yeah. And, you know, I just, um, 
when they left the ark, they, something changed, and he said, okay, animals too. Okay. But he had specific ones that you weren't supposed to eat, and so on and so forth. They were right. clean and unclean and differentiated that. We're not going to get into all that here. But, right. Um, they weren't supposed to eat each other. And they're not supposed to eat each other. <laughs> yeah. Cannibalism, no. Steak, yes. Especially ribeye. Mm. All right. Actually, I had a... Never mind. <laughs> I had a bad one the other. I didn't know you could do a bad ribeye. You just cook it, but they did something to it, and it was pretty bad. You ever been to a smash burger? No. no. You ever heard of them? Heard of it. Yeah. And so now it's all the rage. They'll, they'll smash the thing to cook it and make it crispy and seal in the juices, and supposedly, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's what they did with my ribeye. I think they mashed it, and it was, it was awful. It was tough. And I'm not going to tell you where I got it. Um, <laughs> I don't think it picked up. How how can we think about dinosaurs? Okay, by extension, this can be construed that, to refer to animals as well as dinosaurs. Okay, so how can we think of dinosaurs as being herbivorous when conventional wisdom, and there's that word again, conventional wisdom, informs us that many of the dinosaurs were carnivorous. So conventional wisdom may be wrong. No one has ever seen dinosaurs eat. We make educated guesses at best. If scientists knew nothing about the diet of the apes generally and found fossil gorilla skeletons possessing huge skulls with massive lower jaws connected to the top of the skull ridge for power, scientists would probably conclude that the gorilla was a carnivore. However, the gorilla is 100% herbivorous. You ever seen the jaw of those things? Yeah. They have Big old pointy teeth? They, could they got ripped something. hair stuff going. Yeah, they yeah they're right up on in there. So it might have been a defensive, you know, you know, they don't eat meat and go hunting for it, but it might have been something they can use to fight off bad people, bad animals, right? Okay, so... Um, Dogs and cats live on vegetable matter their whole lives. The base ingredient for almost all dry dog food and cat food is either corn or wheat. Now that has changed somewhat. you got different brands and they're saying that they, they have meat ingredients and those sorts of things. Um, I don't know. The, 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 my daughter is a vet tech, veterinarian technician. She works at the animal hospital. Uh, they have the big guns and stuff. So when animal clinics can't do it, they've got the MRIs and the CT scan and all that stuff that they can do for animals at one location. Do you remember where McGrath's fish house used to be? Yeah. Yeah, that's now an animal hospital. So that's where she works. Yeah. I walked in there and there weren't any waitresses to take me to the table. So we had to sit and wait in the front until she was ready and they could come see us. We went to visit her. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Um, Flying foxes, which have heads and teeth very similar to their larger quadrupeded cousins, are nevertheless 100% herbivorous. So sharp, pointy teeth doesn't necessarily mean eat meat. Conclusions notwithstanding, yes sir? So like dinosaurs, when they find those fossils, do they find that the herbivores are older than the ones that they think are like a Tyrannosaurus rex, like they find a Tyrannosaurus rex bones, are they like younger than they, or do they all kind of think of them in the same? Um, I don't know that any specific study's been done on that, but as far as I know and I'm aware, uh, they appear to be um, coexistent. I, I don't think there's a clear transition from lots of plant eating animals, then all of a sudden these other animals evolved to start eating them. I don't see that. I'm not aware of that. I haven't heard of anybody really making that distinction. It would be an interesting distinction to make, but I don't think it'd be one that could be supported. I mean, you, you see the, uh, like Bernal, Utah, uh, and other places, there are huge mass graves where thousands of animal fossils are found, and carnivore and herbivore, or uh, allegedly carnivore, carnivore herbivore, are all part of it. They're all mashed together, which, by the way, is a pretty significant indicator of some cataclysmic event like a flood. 
for example. So anyway, which we're tiptoeing toward, but we're not there yet. So, uh, even if conventional wisdom is right, fiat creationists are not without explanation. Fiat creationists hold that Precambrian strata containing virtually no fossils were deposited during creation week and prior to the flood, whereas the Paleozoic strata, allegedly 500 to 200 million years, uh, fossils up to primitive reptiles were deposited during the early flood. The Mesozoic strata, 200 to 70 uh, dinosaur fossils were deposited during the late flood and the Cenozoic strata, that is 70 million years to the present, mammal fossils have been deposited since the flood. Hmm. That makes sense? Now, before, uh, bef before the first week, it's just mud. Virtually no fossils. Precambrian strata. You know, lots of mud, maybe some bacteria. I'm not even sure. I, I suspect there may be some bacterial fossils there. All right, uh, any questions so far? So where dinosaurs and Noah's Ark? That's a pretty good question. And one we kind of need to contend with. So uh, generally, uh, we believe that there were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. However, uh, did not have to be fully mature, 50 foot tall, 50 ton ultrasaurs when juveniles would have served very well for this purpose. Could all animals actually fit into the ark? Uh, interesting that dinosaur bones are commonly found in fossil graveyards. Numerous fossils we just mentioned found washed together in a colossal collection. The Wisong mentions uh, 6,000 vertebrates in one site in Geisholstall, Germany. A thousand fish in one square yard on the old red sandstone of England, Dinosaur National Monument contains the remains of over 300 different kinds of dinosaurs and so on. Okay, so interestingly, we find these things in giant graveyards. Uh, creationists would contend that these fossils do not represent isolated local catastrophes over long periods of time, but issue uh, from one global catastrophe where individual burials took place all over the world in a short period of time. You've heard me use the phrase rapid deposition, mm -hmm. that is, rapidly depositing stuff. Um, and when, when you're deprived of the oxygen to interact, once they get buried like that, you're not going to have the biological activity that causes animals and plants to break down and become part of the dirt part of the, the loam or whatever, right? So that explains why they're caught in that, whatever they're caught in, whatever form of existence and development in which they're found. Um, Mace Baker provides the following eight evidences. We're gonna to touch lightly. Uh, dinosaurs are killed by catastrophism, not by gradual uniform processes. And before we do this, by the way, scientists say the same thing. They just don't want it to be a flood, so they come up with some gigantic meteorite that caused it. Well, I don't know, maybe God threw a big old rock at the earth to sort of get stuff going. I have no idea. But as far as I know, he spoke, and the, the waters of the deep, and the, the, the rains came, and all these happened, which could easily have, talk, have brought about tectonic activity to cause these, uh, these huge plates to move around that had been previously supported uh, on a hydraulic or, you know, water-based layer underneath them under great pressure. And when that started to crack, then this stuff started squirting out under huge pressure. So we have the, the waters of the deep flooding out, literally. And I mean, <laughs> did you see that secular attempt at, at Noah's Ark with what's his name in it? Oh, what was his name? With, uh, yeah, Russell Crowe. Russell, Russell Crowe. Crow. Oh, no. Wasn't uh, that weird? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're the guardians. You know, that, I'm not sure that works. But anyway, I, I, I didn't see that. I don't see that in the Bible, you know, these weird creatures. But anyway, uh, they, they had geysers squirting up. So they were trying to show that. But I think it would have been much more cataclysmic and, and, and on a much larger scale 
We're not talking about squirt gun stuff compared to a whole planet. Those are little squirt guns. But when tectonic plates shift and stuff happens, I mean, things explode. That's a lot of pressure. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that, that's the deal with the uh, so-called Yellowstone caldera. I've talked mm -hmm. to you about that, I think. But the, if that ever goes, that is a planet killer. So anyway, uh, so uh, squat heavy armored dinosaurs typically found fossilized upside down, apparently overturned by turbulent floodwaters. They, in a, they get floating, they're not, they're top heavies that are going to end up that way. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, dinosaur fossils have been found on every continent, which supports the notion of a Pangaea. Right? You know, Pangaea is, that's the, the first continent, and then it broke apart, right? All right? Uh, swamp dwelling hadrosaur, the duckbill uh, fossils, have been found inside the Arctic Circle. Cold. Wow, weren't they cold? Virtually all hadrosaurs are found in swamp like habitats. However, one hadrosaur was found with pine needles in its stomach, running to higher ground during the flood, maybe? possible. Skeletons of 31 iguanodons were found a thousand feet lower than a coal bed in Belgium, meaning fossil and coal formation could have occurred in any order. The strata there would normally indicate that the coal formation is older than the dinosaurs. Also, note that coal forms on a seven to one ratio. It takes seven feet of compressed vegetation to form one foot of coal at that, and, and by the way, ladies, uh, that seven feet compresses down to a couple of inches to form a diamond. Anyway, all right, so that, we're not talking about diamonds here, but we don't care. Did diamonds exist on Noah's Ark? Who cares? Mm -hmm. uh, at that Noah's rate, Noah's wife. What? Noah's wife. You asked who cares. I said Noah's wife. Well, she didn't care anymore, but she might have back then. Okay, let me ask I who cared. To, okay, now you say Noah's wife. Uh, at that rate, all of the present vegetation would not produce the known coal deposits. Think about that one for a second. There's a 1.4 times the coal that we have present plant material. Another type of question. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, maybe. There are fairly recent reports. I mean, there are tribal pictures of things with a long neck and a huge body and a, and a trailing tail and short, stumpy legs in the deepest jungles of Africa. So people saw something, not just bones lying in a pile in the dirt. Could that be made up, though? Could what be made up? There could be, yeah. But the tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and thousands and thousands and thousands in these huge graveyard deposits, who's going to spend the time to do that in a, in a, in a, a place and, and, and make con uh, cr uh, concrete casts and molds and stuff and then go strew them in Vernal, Utah and then bury them under you know, tons of rock and everything else to make them look like they were actually there under rock. I mean, wait a minute. We can't really make rock on that scale, right? Okay. She was so, in last class, so um, also that because of the atmosphere, right? Of how it the changes. vapor canopy and the what? Why the reptiles don't grow? Like a uniform. Maybe. Yeah, the vapor canopy we talked about last time, uh, and it, and it gave a uniform. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Climate. Biosphere throughout the world, right? Uh, and then suddenly it changed drastically, and a, a bunch of the animals probably couldn't survive. Uh, the only place they could survive, especially the ones that required uh, the, the, the pl lush plant life and abundance of that plant life in a jungle format, 
would have to be in the tropical areas of the world. The rest of them would die off. So we don't see too many, and I don't know. I mean, the, the plesiosaur that we mentioned, or something that certainly looked like it, was brought brought ashore by some uh, Japanese uh, fishermen. See, I mean, that's well documented. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm not one for conspiracy theories. Uh, I don't think uh, anybody is running around creating huge fossil deposit veins to, to fool people into thinking stuff. There is a theory that says the devil did it because the devil wanted to confuse Christians and make us not believe in God or something. You know, I mean, there, there are theories that do that. Um, but as, as we talked earlier, uh, science needs to be able to speak to the issue with evidence. Yes, sir? I think to maybe uh, answer her question a little bit, she's asking, well, why don't we have dinosaurs now? Um, I'm not saying we don't, that was my right. point. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we still have animals going extinct today. Mm -hmm. And so we have an extinction record and an extinction path right. of other types of animals, ones that couldn't survive because the vegetation is not available, would uh, follow that track and become extinct. And I think that's what you're seeing in um, the record after the flood is there, there was two of each kind. However, some could not survive in the new world after because there wasn't the vegetation to allow them to gain size. Okay. Yes, sir. So for, um, like, like um, dinosaurs that live in the sea. Yeah. Would that? Would they, they wouldn't have been affected by a flood. They'd be in hog heaven. So. Look, I got a big place to swim now. So I mean, I don't know, watch I out for that rock. Were were there, I guess, dinosaur-sized animals that were living in the ocean? Absolutely. So what happened? That's a plesiosaur. So what happened with them then? Well, I don't know. The plesiosaur was pulled up from a fairly deep area. So the, I mean, the plesiosaur was there. It got pulled up. Where has it been all this time? Are there others like it, or is it the last of its kind? Those kinds of questions. But if, if, if this plesiosaur lived very deep and would come up and breathe and go down way deep again, um, we probably won't see much of them. But there are, are all kinds of stories about sea monsters. Okay, some of those you hear the howling wind and you see the huge waves and the boat gets battered apart and I'm floating along on a piece of flotsam, you know, a piece of wood or something to survive after the thing and the howling, the howling wind becomes a huge monster that <laughs> bit the thing and tore it apart or, or whatever. I mean, some of that may be a construct in somebody's mind trying to explain something that was too big to see in, at one time and understand. Some of it may have some basis in reality. Uh, there is a strong um, mythical tradition of dragons that breathe fire. Uh, is there such a thing? Well, I don't know that we've ever seen it, but why do those kinds of images and pictures persist? Did you know that every people group, and I'm going to say this again, but I'm going to say it now since we're on the subject, Every known people group on planet Earth has a flood story. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I think that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, where do they come up with this flood story if there wasn't something back in their ancestral history that happened, got handed down from generation to generation from the survivors? So I find it interesting that there are these stories, there are these pictures, there are these uh, uh, petroglyphs depicting large animals and creatures that uh, appear to resemble the dinosaurs we've been able to piece together from the fossil record. Well, like, I mean, I know it sounds like silly, but at Loch Ness, they still study and say that there is a creature there that's supposed to be like dinosaur, aquatic dinosaur. And he's pretty good at staying out of sight. Yeah, you know, and I mean, I was reading a book for, uh, well, this was back when I was a kid and doing the, like a little study, and it's like they were saying there's a lot of, they can't even get down really deep. I guess that 
lake is really deep, oh, yeah. and there's a lot yeah. of canals and channels outside caves and stuff that used to, I guess, the saltwater ocean used to be able to come through there, mm -hmm. and they're saying maybe that's how it, you know, and I guess you'd get lost under the water. It's so dark and murky and everything like that that there's been scuba divers that have gone down there and had trouble finding their way back up, so trying to see something down there would be mm -hmm. hard. You never know. Problematic, so, right. So, you know, I mean, when, when we see things like that, I mean, mythology is going to do what it's going to do. What about Bigfoot and Yeti and all that kind of stuff? You know, they never appear. We see them, but there are pictures of them. Must be true. Saw a thing going, it must be, must be UFOs and aliens. You know, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff, and you're going to have exaggeration. You're going to have imaginative explanations, but you're also probably, if you're able to investigate it back far enough, find some kernel of truth from which these notions spring. And that's, that's sort of the point. We need to, in a, a, an organized and rational way, find our way back through the data and see what information is there that supports or at least gives indication to something like this. Yes? So, um, people, I guess, actually, scientists are finding a lot of fossils of dinosaurs, right? Like, as you're saying. Shouldn't they also be finding a lot of uh, human bones, too, because people died in the flood? Yeah. So then, why are we... So why are they not mentioning that, but they're mentioning a bunch of stuff about, like, uh, dinosaurs? I wrote a whole book on it. There's all kinds of fossil record of humans and, and uh, pre-human forms, supposedly. So, you know, I mean, um, and, and I mentioned the book. I'll go ahead and show it on the tape thing here. Bones of Contention, Martin Lubino. Remember that? And he goes into great depth about the fossil record, human fossils, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of information out there. So that's about pre-flood humans? This is about the fossil record, and he deals with uh, pre-flood humans, yes. What was the author again? Lubenow, L-U-B-E-N-O-W, Marvin is his first name. Thank you. Marvelous Marvin. And this is published by Baker Bookhouse, Thank which you. is, by the way, a fairly good source of conservative uh, material, theological and otherwise. So he writes from both a Christian and, and scientific point of view. Okay. All right. Good book. All right, uh, so uh, uh, dinosaur tracks are commonly discovered without trail tail tracks. Rather than postulate that all dinosaurs had tendons which get their tails erect, it seems more plausible to maintain that the tracks were made while animals walked in water. So something happened. If all this is true, there's no reason why some dinosaurs could not have survived to the present. Most of the huge animals probably could not live in the altered post-flood climate, but some of them could have. A 10-foot tall, 6-ton African elephant eats 200 pounds of food each day. How much would a 50-foot tall, 50-ton ultrasaurus eat? And if there isn't enough food source, he'd starve to death. Mm -hmm. See? So they may not have survived to the present. Uh, and uh, on April 25, 1977, a Japanese fishing ship hauled a 32-foot-long, 4,000-pound, that's two tons, right, a dinosaur-looking creature. The flesh of the animal was fish or reptilian, not mammal, mammalian. That's what we're talking about. There's pictures of it in the newspaper when it happened. Okay, any questions? Now we're going to get into the flood. And the reason there isn't a flat earth. 
No, I'm just, just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. So, critics first begin disbelieving the Bible, began disbelieving the Bible in Genesis 6, 1 through 9, 17, Noah's flood. Once Noah's flood was questioned and rejected, it was not too long before many other parts of the Bible were written off as myth. There are numerous questions that need to be answered. Was the flood really global? How did all the animals fit into the ark? How did Noah and his family take care for all the animals? Uh, care for the all? Uh, where did all the water come from for the flood? If there really was a global flood, where did all the water go? If there really was a global flood, what evidence is there that it ever happened? Pretty good questions. Hmm? Seashells when they're hiking. Absolutely. I mean, trilobites on top of Mount Everest. 29,900 feet tall. That's a lot of mountain. All right. Um, so was it global in extent or was it localized? The following texts were taken in a straightforward manner appear to require a universal or global flood, and there they are for you to look at, including one in the New Testament in 2 Peter. Okay? Now we're not going to review all of them. We took a little extra time, some other stuff today, but they're there for your perusal at your leisure. It rained 40 days and nights. The waters rose for 40 days. The waters prevailed for another 110 days. They remained level. According to 8.2 in Genesis, it took 224 days for the area around Mount Ararat to become dry enough for the people and animals to get off the boat. Art. The total time from the first rainfall to the disembarking was 371 days. Note that the people and animals disembarked from an elevated location, which means the prob water probably took longer to abate from lower regions. Yes. Really good question, unless I'm just not catching on. So if it was 224 days before the water stopped, plus 40 days while I was reading, is that 264, not 374? Or 371? I missed you. 224 days for the area around to become dry enough? Right. And then it says um, the total time for the first rainfall to the disembark was 371 days. Is that 264, 40 plus the... So you're just saying the whole time. So like basically from the I'd time like the rain started... Everything was dry. Well, okay, the, the 40 was during. We have a during thing going. So two simultaneous. The, it rained for 40 days and nights. Waters prevailed for another 110 days. So that's 150. And it took 224 days for the area around. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay? Yeah, I got it. All right. All right, so, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I should have leaned forward, but my back is kind of giving me spits here. Okay, if the flood was local, an ark would have been utterly unnecessary. It appears that a straightforward reading of the text allows for no interpretation other than a global flood. Okay, so, and I, I want to, I wanna, he keeps using, you know, in, in these references that I have in here, um, the, the uh, straightforward reading. In other words, if we just read it at face value without reading anything into it or building some sort of a house of cards on it to explain something else or whatever, then a straightforward reading, a read it as is, uh, seems to indicate a global flood. So that's when we say straightforward, that's really kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, the size of the ark. Genesis puts it at 18 uh, inches per cubit. The ark was 450 foot long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet tall with three decks. The second time a ship was this long was in 1884, and that was the ocean liner Eturia. So that was a pretty interesting accomplishment. Yes? Sorry, this question is kind of late, but um, how is there enough clouds for what? Yeah, enough clouds for it to rain for so long? Yeah, because, okay, so I've talked to somebody and they say that the earth is covered in water, so that's how, um, the, so like the floodgates of heaven are open, and that's why. The floodgates of the earth, yeah. Yeah, so if it rains, that means there's supposed to be clouds. 
rain wasn't the only source of water, though. So if you have the ocean, the waters of the deep coming out, and you have a an already um, tropical kind of an environment, we're going to have a very fast repetition of evaporation, condensation, and rainfall. So it, one feeds on the other; it becomes sort of a cycle. Plus, uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about. I mean, we haven't here, but. I've mentioned before that tectonic activity is going to produce a lot of volcanic activity, which means there's going to be a lot of heat generated, and so that'll that'll contribute mm -hmm. to the evaporation and raining, mm -hmm. and then eventually it'll also create an Arctic winter, mm -hmm. and only stuff on top is going to survive, like I don't know an ark, you know, because those poor tropical animals buried in Siberia above the Arctic Circle were flash frozen, mm -hmm. along with the tropical plants. So th these are all part of the same big question. That's a good question. But, but does that make sense? Yeah, OK. Um, so we got some issues of floor space, volume, and space utilization. Now, uh, OK, well, let's just kind of work through these. Genesis 620 uh, indicate three groups of animals, birds, animals and uh, creatures that move along the ground. So livestock and wild animals have come under the heading of animals. Uh, creatures that move along the ground, lizards and snakes, I suppose, and, and, and uh, oh, reptile and amphibian. That's what I'm trying to say. OK, so you're going to have both. Uh, unclean kinds would have one pair represented, while clean kinds would probably have seven pairs. Uh, Genesis 7.22 limits the scope of the flood's destruction to everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils, which gets to the question earlier, I think. Somebody, was that you that asked that? Or somebody else did about, what about were there animals under the sea that big and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, and they were still having fun. But uh, when, when climate started to change and oceans began to change temperature, they probably had to go deeper near the Earth's crust to stay warm or coal, uh, either way. Um, another limit on the uh, kind of number of animals required is the Hebrew word min, and translated kind, in most English versions, functions at approximately the family level. So you've got kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So from family, the genus and species can have a huge variety in the same family of animals, right? Does that make sense? So, but it reduces the total number because kingdom, phylum, class, order, all of the species from each of those don't necessarily have to be represented. So give an example. Cats. All right. Um, uh, apes. There are a lot of different apes. Not related to monkeys, but similar. Mm -hmm. So you've got a family, and you've got two variations. You've got monkeys, and you have apes. Apes don't have tails. Monkeys do. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a very simplistic one, I suppose. But that's an example of a kind. Um, you know, we look at uh, animals. We raise goats and cows. Sheep, right? Sheep and goats are kinds, but not the same. So they're probably representative sheep and representative goats. Horses, right? Mules, and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> after a careful analysis of the groupings of animals in the Pentateuch, biologist Arthur Jones notes that Noah was not given any instructions by God concerning invertebrates. So germs and, and things like that, amoeba and those sorts of things, and eh, who cares if they show up or not? because they live in the water and they live in animals and that and the other. So invertebrates uh, weren't really specifically dealt with. So we only have to deal with vertebrates that breathe, land, breathe air and walk on the land. Or the fall, what? Or fly. Or fly, yeah, because mm -hmm. they got to land somewhere and they got to eat stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, the following is a listing of the animals that we include as being present, terrestrial birds, dinosaurs, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and an uncertain number of unknown animals that were probably on the ark, but are now extinct with no trace. 
Maybe they had dodo birds on the ark. I don't know, but they're gone. They they existed into our time in the late eight, late 19th, early 20th century, I guess, and disappeared. And there are other other uh, like the the what is the the condor out in California that is endangered. There are a lot of endangered species. I mean, this happens. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's not all because humans bad, animals good. Um, it just, it, it's just part of the life cycle and that God created. All right. Um, now, another guy, Woodmore, uh, tabulates all kinds of genera of animals living and extinct uh, and arrives at a figure of 15,754 animals on the ark. More than half of all the animals in the ark were smaller than a rat. Only 11% of the animals on the ark were larger than a sheep. If God brought Noah only fully grown adult animals. Now Noah's ark should not be compared to a zoo which provides spacious accommodations for its animals. Since the flood was a unique emer excuse me, emergency situation, all we need to prove is sufficient room for animals to survive in reasonable health for just over a year. Less than half the floor space of the ark was necessary for the animal cages. Food and water could have been stored overhead in all three decks in this model. Now, how did animals of different climates uh, migrate to the ark and survive on the ark? Animals in zoological gardens all over the world demonstrate their ability to adjust to, adjust to a new climate. Uh, shepherds in Mongolia use camels to journey across snowy mountains and Arctic and tropical crustaceans can coexist at temperatures in the range of 10 to 20 uh, degrees Celsius. Does that all make sense? Okay. And at this time, we would, we would, it would be one, talking about one piece of land, Pangea. Right? So they would yes, be, they because this is when things started breaking apart. Right? So would, would they even been technically mountainous cold areas? Would have been kind of maybe not necessarily, probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, the mountains are demonstrably along coastlines and seem to be at the edge of tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. So migration of animals to the ark would probably not have been long difficult. distance. Maybe not so much climatically disparate, right? right. And what was coming to the ark would have been able to live within a much similar climate. Right. Now it's going to go through some changes when some of this stuff takes place outside the ark, but again, inside the ark, things are going to maintain you right. know, a certain degree of, of um, conformity, uniformity. All right, I got to got to run this through. How long did it take? For all the animals to board, assume that Noah did not carry them aboard one at a time. The intervening 4,500 <laughs> years since the flood is more than enough time to account for the speciation, that is, one observes among present living things when they begin to go back out from families into individual genus and species, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, conclusion then is that the ark was more than large enough to provide housing for the 16,000 or so animals that would have been on board, Whitcomb and Morris both conclude that 35,000 animals could be shipped in two trains, 73 cars long each. Okay, any questions? Any comments? Any fears you wish to express about where we're going? All right, well stay tuned and we'll continue this discussion. Thank you for the good questions, by the way. And let's have a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask you to bless each one here today. We pray for your blessing on those who are, are coming to the church. And I pray that you would just change hearts and minds in the service and the various ministry activities that are taking place throughout the campus for children and youth. I pray, God, that the worship team would just uh, uh, be, have a sense of your presence as you work through them and as they approach you in the throne room of grace, I pray that the congregation or zzz, congregations would follow them into your presence. I pray that people would be hungry and ready to receive all that you have in each area and venue of ministry. We just thank you and praise you for Pastor's uh, service today as his, his message to the worship team. 
uh, all those other teams that work behind the scenes to make things come together. And we just ask your blessing on each person coming to this church today that you would touch their hearts and minds, transform them from one degree of glory to the next in the image of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.